Hello everypony, this is Dash of Salt, also known as Dash of Halide here, and I'm doing a tutorial series on how to vector ponies from My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. What I'm going to be doing here is turning this particular screenshot into a vector. So the first question is, what do you need to actually vector ponies? Well, you're going to need an image of some kind, like the screenshot here, or perhaps you have a sketch that you've scanned into your computer, or an image from somewhere on the internet that you just want to vectorize. If you plan on doing a, an image from the show, you're going to get a copy of the show somehow, uh, load into a program like VLC here, and VLC, you are able to actually take a snapshot using the video snapshot function here. By default, it'll save a screenshot of the show into the documents folder where you can retrieve it and then use it later with our vectoring program. I will be using Inkscape here. It's a freely available open source vector graphics program available on inkscape.org. Then you're also going to need a color guide of some kind for the particular pony you're going to be vectorizing. I prefer to use Kefka Floyd's color guides here, but there are several floating around the internet that work out pretty well. I'll provide some links to this stuff in the description of the video. Finally, I like to have this particular extension here for Inkscape because it helps you out a lot when drawing ellipses, which are really important when you need to draw eyes on ponies. As an example, the color guide we'll be using today I have the Pinkie Pie color guide, and we'll be using these various hex colors later to actually select the color for various body parts on Pinkie. So the next thing you'll want to do is open up Inkscape. By default, it's going to look something like this. To navigate, you can hold down your mouse button and move around. You can hold down control and zoom in and out with your mouse wheel, which is my preferred way of zooming. Or you can use the zoom buttons up here. I usually never use these. I'm not a huge fan of this palette at the bottom of the, of the window, so I usually turn it off. Um, you're not really going to need it all that much anyway if you're going to be using a color guide to color various parts of your ponies. Then the next thing I don't really like is the fact that this particular drawing sc screen size here doesn't match the resolution of my computer. So I'm just going to create a new one. And we'll see that the size of this particular drawing space is, matches uh, the resolution of my computer. So I'm just going to close the old version of Inkscape here. I don't need to save anything there. All right, so now we set up our viewing space. What's the next step? Well, we actually want to get our screenshot in here so we can start vectorizing on top of that. How do we do that? Well, there's this import function here. And what we're going to do is choose our screenshot. And we'll say open. Now it's going to prompt us and say, do you want to embed or link to this file? If you embed the file, what it's going to do is take that picture and put it inside the file you save as your vector file. It's an SVG file. And, or, and if you choose link, instead it'll just put a link to the file on your file system. The difference here really is how large do you want your SVG file to be? Um, are you planning on sending this somewhere? Uh, do you really care how large the file gets? I don't care, so I'm just going to embed it. We'll note here that the screenshot I've taken is actually smaller than uh, the size of my screen, which you know should kind of make sense given I took a screenshot out of the program here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to want to lock this image down because you notice we can move it around, you, you could accidentally resize it, you could do silly things to it, and we don't really want to do any of that. So what we'll do is we'll click on this lock button over here. That means once it's unselected, well, we can't do anything more to it. There's no way to select it or to fiddle around with it. This comes in useful later. You could actually, at this point, change the layer and make it less opaque, so it's kind of almost a transparent outline that's the vector on top of. But over time, I've decided that that doesn't really matter. You don't really have to do that. Down here, you have a layer dialog. And it shows you all the various layers that you're drawing on. Right now, I only have one layer. By default, it's layer one. And you can actually hide or show that layer. This is kind of interesting to use because as you draw stuff on the screen here, it's interesting to hide the background reference so you can see what you've drawn so far and admire your pretty work or terrible work as the case may be. So what's the next step you want to do? Normally you want to look at whatever image you're trying to vectorize and decide how it's going to be layered. Why do you want to layer it? Well, it's because you're basically going to have different elements of the drawing layered on top of each other. You can clearly see here that the ear part of this image is going to be on top of, well, pretty much everything else on the entire image. 
the mane is going to be on top of everything except under the ear and also un inconveniently under the body over here but on top of the body over here that's going to play into more complicated tricks we're going to have to do later to make this look right this particular tail is going to be underneath everything because everything effectively lies on top of it. The cutie mark, of course, is going to be above the body and so on and so forth. But really, the only thing you want to worry about right now is just create a bunch of layers. So we'll go up to the layer dialog and hit add a layer. We want, want a layer for the main. Want a layer for the ear. Add a layer for the eyes. Like a layer for the eyelashes. Layer for the mouth, layer for the head, a layer for the cutie mark, a layer for the legs, layer for the tail. And I know this is not set in stone. We can do anything we want to with this layers. And this may not even be the entire comprehensive list of layers we're going to need eventually. For example, okay, we have the main, and that's that's kind of below everything else. That's kind of silly. We don't really want the main there. So what we can do is we're going to layer and say uh, raise layer. And what that'll do is is well, this is one bug with Inkscape here is that Inkscape doesn't actually automatically update this dialog. Once you click a button up there, you actually have to click on another layer and then it will update. And now we'll see that main has risen up one. We look at layer, we say uh, raise layer, layer to top, and that should move it to the top of the list, which indeed makes sense. What we're really going to start with is the ear here. So we want to actually move the ear to the top. So now see our ear is at the top of the list and we're going to start out by drawing on the ear. So what you want to do is choose the layer you want to draw on and then we'll start drawing. First of course I'm going to save this so we don't lose any of our work. So what are we going to start drawing with? Well there's really only one tool you're going to use for the majority of drawing ponies and that's this tool called the Bezier Curves. Why? Because it basically effectively draws straight lines for you. You could use this pencil tool here to try and draw some freehand, freehand stuff, but that doesn't usually work out all that well. Um, here I've got the smoothing set way high, so it doesn't want to actually draw all the crazy things I put in there. Now it does. But the reality is, is most of what you're doing in ponies is going to be straight lines or curved lines. And so what we'll do here is we're on the ear layer. We'll click at kind of this point here of the ear. We'll click up here where the ear kind of makes this inflection point here. And then we'll click down here. Now, at this point, because it's not a closed shape, you're going to need to say, I'm done. And to do that, you either right click on your mouse or you hit the enter key, which I'm just going to hit enter. Now we have one curve here. We need another curve. I'm going to hit the B button to get back my busier curve tool. And we need another line here for the ear part. And I'll hit enter to see that we now have the ear part. Well, this looks kind of like a mess, right? Well, that's okay, because what we're going to do next is fix it up. So you just click on the shape you want to change, and then you click on this button called Edit Paths by Nodes. We'll zoom in a little bit here. Now, you kind of have two options here. You can fiddle around with the nodes by basically clicking on a line and dragging it to where you want it to be, which is the way I do most of it. Or you can also look at this and basically fiddle around with the particular pull knobs they give you here. This gives you a little bit finer control over where the curve's gonna go. But in a lot of cases, I find that if you start out with just pulling the line to where you want it to be, in most cases, it's just going to look okay. So what we'll do is we'll take this other line here and we'll try to draw, draw it over here. Well, this doesn't look quite right, but we can kind of fiddle around with it. Just kind of fix the parts that don't look right. Fiddle around with this a little bit. And that doesn't look too bad. It looks okay. Then we'll take the other line here and we'll kind of drag this over to where it ought to be too. Cool, now the line kind of loosely follows where we want it to be. 
Of course, we're not done yet. It still looks goofy. So let's click on our figure once more. What we're going to do now is we need to make the line thicker, obviously, because it, it just it's not thick enough to cover the object below it. So what we do is we go to Path, because this particular line is called a path in Inkscape. Path, and we'll say we want to... Actually, sorry, we want to go to the object fill and stroke. It's considered an object. This is kind of silly because this is really a path, but Inkscape also kind of groups some of the functions under the object menu. So here we have the fill and stroke menu. This allows us to change various properties about this object. The stroke paint allows us to change the color of the stroke. You can just kind of fiddle around with it. You'll see that I've made it red there. The stroke style allows you to change the width, and that's really what we're looking for. So what you do is you kind of fiddle around the widths here. You kind of look at it, eyeball it. Okay, what does it look like? Uh, to actually get a better feeling for how wide it is, you can basically just hit the uh, uh, layer visibility button here, and that'll show and hide where your object is. This is also super useful when you're dragging lines around because you can see where your line is based on the red line here. So you can actually drag your line a little bit there and then show it again, and then you get a feel for it. But it looks like 6 is pretty good. So we'll stick with that. For this one here, uh, it's really not going to be a 6. It's going to be more like a 3 or 4, perhaps. And then we have to say, well, this is not the right color either, right? Well, what we're going to do is we'll go back to our color guide now, and we'll say, okay, so the body strokes is EB81, B4. So we go to stroke paint, and we go to this RGBA function here. We'll go to the front, and we'll type in EB8. And you'll notice how the colors are changing for you while I type this in. 1B4. And that looks pretty much like the pink we want. You'll notice this FF at the end. The FF actually controls transparency. So if we change this thing here, which is kind of your alpha transparency way down, you'll notice how it changes the FF at the end. We're not going to fool with that because we don't actually want to make anything transparent on this image. You could also fiddle with the opacity. The opacity is actually separate. It works much the same way as the alpha transparency does. We don't really want to fiddle with that either. So now we have kind of the right color here. Well. I don't want to copy this color around over the place. Well, you could. You could copy the color and go over here and change the color, and it would be all nice. Or what you could do is you can hit Control C for copy, and then it's, you can you could do a Control V, and that basically duplicates the shape. We don't really want the shape, right? So we'll get rid of that. But you can hit a Control Shift V, and that will actually copy the style, which includes the color. Now the trick here is the style also includes the width, which we don't really want. So we'll go back to 3 again, or was it 4? There we go. So we have kind of something roughly shaped like the ear, which, you know, it's still blocky at the edges and nasty, and it's, well, it's not really like it at all. Let's not lie. So how do we make this actually be nice and rounded curves? Well, there's a, an interesting function in Inkscape which allows you to say, choose this particular path, which is we call a path object, and we're going to change it into an object. If I can remember how to do that again. Actually, it's in the path. Here we go. The object to path. Actually, the other way around. Sorry, the stroke to path. So it considers these to be strokes, also known as paths. Really rather confusing if you think about it. So you shouldn't think about it. So what we've done here is we've basically changed a path which has an inner line to an object that's kind of rectangular or curvy which has lines on the outer side so really what's happened here is your path is now outside the shape instead of inside the shape interior so you've kind of made this the outline so for example if we go over here and we change the stroke paint to something it makes it rather large which of course is not what we want we actually just want the object here so if you click on the object and then you click on visibility now you can see okay so my object doesn't really look what it needs to be, but it's closer now because now we kind of have an outline. So what we can do is we can choose this corner node here and we can delete that and now it looks kind of curvy. We can take this corner node here and delete that. So it looks additionally, well, really super funky and weird. But now what we can do is we can drag this over here, drag this down over here, 
and then we can kind of fool around with these curves until it looks close to what we're interested in having it look like. So we'll just pull that down there, pull this up a little here, nip and tuck and plastic surgery and all that. And then when we show it again, it looks not half bad. So that kind of almost matches what we're looking for. Kind of check to see what it looks like without any interference. You can just hide that layer and we can see, oh, well, maybe it looks a tad fat or something. We don't really like the look so much. So we can kind of fiddle with it a little bit here. Well, that doesn't look too bad. So then we'll go and show everything again. And then we kind of follow the same methodology again to fix this. So I like using my shortcut here, which is control alt C. This converts the path to an object again. You'll note that it's decided to put three nodes up here, which is a little goofy, but oh well, we don't really care too much because what we're really trying to do here is again, get this kind of sharp point on the curve. So we're gonna do that here. Well, we'll just do that. We'll move this over here a little bit. It's all kind of a game to kind of make it match up with what you want it to match up with. Uh, I mean, there's no errors you can make here. It's all what looks right to you, really. And again, you don't have to 100% match this with your reference image. It's whatever looks good to you. You're being the artist. You can decide however you want it to look. You'll note that when I fooled around with, around with this curve here, I kind of made it not match up again with this corner here, which is kind of annoying, but we can kind of fix that by dragging it down a little bit to see that it matches up. There's also another little trick here to try and make sure that this matches up. This particular node here is called a corner node because it's got, it's almost acts like a corner like this guy up here. But you can change to a different type of node. There are a couple different types of nodes. One of them is called a smooth node. If you change this to a smooth node, what I'll try to do is smooth out the incoming angle of the curves coming in and going out. In a lot of cases, this will smooth your lines out and make it look much nicer. It doesn't work in all cases though. So you have to be a little bit careful with it. You can fool around with that a little bit to see if it makes it look nicer for you. There's also a few other options too, like a symmetric node, which basically means that the handles on both sides of the node have to be the same length. Or uh, auto smooth, where it has like an algorithm that tries to make it smoother. I usually find that these two never help me out at all, so I never use them. Okay, we're almost done with the ear here, so let's just finish it up and make it look nice. Same thing here, we'll... Well, yeah, we'll delete this outer node here. We'll drag this down. Kind of drag this out a little bit to make it look nicer. Kind of give it a more of a point. And then we'll look at again what it looks like here. There's the tendency when you convert stuff to objects that you end up a lot of extra nodes that makes the curves look a little bit funkier than you would like them to look. So what you can do is you can just say, I don't really want that curve there. And you delete it, and in a lot of cases, that'll smooth your curves out for you. That's always another thing to try if you're having problems making your curves look right, is just delete couple to make it nicer. Again, this one doesn't quite look right, and it looks a little bit better now. I'll make this one a uh, smooth node to try and smooth that line out again. So again, we'll hide this and then look at it and say to ourselves, does that look like what we want it to look like? Well, kind of. Eh, it doesn't look too bad. You can fool around with it some more to try and make it look nicer. Again, this guy probably ought to be a smooth node. There are recommendations that all of the interior nodes ought to be smooth nodes. Sometimes that doesn't always work for you. Uh, if you just get it as close as you can with the uh, handles, then Sometimes that works actually works out better, which seems kind of strange, but you know, that's just the way it is. Whatever looks best. Additionally, bear in mind, once you change stuff to smooth nodes, it'll try to keep the curve smooth no matter what you do to it. If you, if you made this one a corner node, then when you move this, it won't move the thing on the other side, which can be very useful in some situations. All right. That's uh, all I'm going to do for this particular tutorial. I'll be back another time for more vectoring magic. So long.